Hey everyone, welcome to Good Friday Service. We're gonna be starting things here pretty soon. And I just wanna remind you that this coming Sunday is Easter. And this is one of the times of the year when our friends and family are more open to an invitation to church than any other time of year. So uh, this is a great time for you to take the opportunity to reach out to those friends and those family members and invite them to our online gathering uh, of church this Sunday. Um, so get the links ready so that you can email them out or text them out to people for either YouTube or Facebook. Either one is great. Um, but make sure that you engage with them as you guys are watching the message together um, and getting a chance to hear about Jesus. And this might be a chance, uh, maybe the first time that one of your friends or family have ever heard about Jesus and what he's done for them. So um, take this opportunity to really reach out to your friends and your family and invite them to come join you as you engage with us at church on Easter Sunday morning. Um, love you guys. Get ready because we're going to start here pretty soon. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Who? 
Hi, church family. So glad that you chose to take a few minutes tonight on Good Friday to spend some time together to talk about what it is we remember and celebrate on this day. And so I'd like to pray and then jump right into uh, what was accomplished for us by Jesus on the cross um, years ago that we get to find life and joy in now. So let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for this time to contemplate, consider, and be moved by what you did for us out of your great mercy and love. And God, I pray that you would help us to receive fully, grasp more in depth um, the revelation of your love for us through Christ. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what I hope to do in our time tonight together is talk about what happened and why Jesus went through what he went through for us. So first, let's talk a little bit about what happened. What, what is Good Friday? But I want to rewind to the evening before because I think it helps us to kind of see the big picture. And um, Jesus, after accomplishing all of his ministry on earth and his, his perfect sinless life on earth um, comes to Passover, which would have been Thursday, when he tells his disciples to go and prepare the meal so that they can take the Passover feast and meal together, which was them remembering back to the Exodus where a lamb was slain and the blood was uh, put on the door frame that God would pass over them with his wrath. And for those that were under the blood of the lamb, there would no longer be wrath for them as everyone else in the nation of Egypt um, would receive God's wrath at that time. And so it's this amazing remembrance that Jesus will repurpose. And so they get together, they're uh, breaking bread together, having a meal together, this meal specifically, and he looks at them and, and tells them, one of you will betray me. And, and that would be a lot to kind of work through, right? Jesus, the Messiah, he's been showing his authority over all things in the way that he teaches and the actions that he does. And then looking at those that are closest to him, that have been doing ministry along with him, that he sent out to do ministry, uh, he says, one of you is going to be betray me. And then uh, we know that that night he also institutes communion. He repurposes the Passover to say that he's the, the greater lamb that was broken, that his blood is the one that covers us. And so breaking the bread, he says, this is my body. And, and taking the cup, this is the blood of the new covenant that for the forgiveness of sins. And so um, we, I'm bummed, aren't together at the school because uh, for a service tonight because we had actually finally cleared for the first time our ability to take communion together. And so moving forward, I'm excited because we'll be able to find ways to do that when we can gather back together again. But Jesus, on that night, he institutes communion. He tells them that one of them will betray him. And then after they have this meal together, they sing a hymn together, which I think is cool. On their way to go, they're going to go out to the Mount of Olives and they sing this hymn. And um, we're nowhere led to believe that they have any instruments with them. I think it's interesting that these guys would just gather together with their voices and sing unto God. And from there, they would go to the Mount of Olives. Jesus would predict um, that all would fall away. In fact, would say that all of you will fall away tonight. And Peter, who is passionate, right, would say, maybe everybody else will, but I never will. And Jesus lets him know that you're going to disown me three times before the morning comes. Like before the rooster crows in the morning, you'll deny me three times. And so 
From there, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus tells his disciples, you stay here, I'm going to go further and pray. But he takes with him Peter, James, and John, goes a little further, and then stops them and says, you watch out. I'm going to go even further and pray, which is an interesting thing. Okay, so Judas is already gone, so there's 11 disciples. So he tells eight of them, you stay here, brings three with him, and tells Peter, James, and John, you keep watch. And I want to frame this for you a little bit because in Luke it says, do we have swords with us? Like, make sure we have swords. And they say, we have two swords, says that'll be enough. And so when he says keep watch, sometimes we just think that they were his prayer partners out there just praying for him. Um, But they were literally told to keep guard um, so that Jesus could get away and accomplish what he needed to accomplish at that time. And so Jesus pulls away from them and it says he, he kneels down on his face and prays. Um, if it is possible, to the Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And what is that cup? That is the cup of the wrath of God being poured out on sin, that Jesus would take our sin upon himself and receive the punishment for our sins on himself. And that he's working through how brutal that is, um, and submitting himself to the plan, to the will of the Father. And he comes back to his disciples uh, that are supposed to be keeping watch and finds them sleeping and tells them, you know, watch and pray because your flesh is weak. So pray to stay strong and keep watch. And he goes back and prays again, comes back and they're asleep, goes back and prays, come back, comes back and they're asleep. And, And he says, the hour has come here comes my betrayer. And you know if you've read the Bible before, and if not, let me clue you in. One of Jesus' own disciples, Judas, has sold him out and has betrayed him. And Judas is coming, and he's coming with a large crowd to the garden. It's the, it, it's the middle of the night, and he comes to the garden with this large crowd with swords and clubs. He has a mob coming to get Jesus. And he's set this up with them to say, hey, The one that is Jesus is the one that I will show up and kiss. And so he comes to Jesus. Jesus knows what he's going to do. And he says, do what you came here to do, my friend. And Judas betrays him with a kiss. He kisses Jesus. And as they seize Jesus, they grab Jesus. Um, Peter, again, uh, I love his passion. Sometimes he misses the mark, but he's going to miss it full speed. Um, And so he pulls the sword out that is his sword and, and cuts off the ear of a servant of the high priest. And uh, this is significant because sometimes I think we hear that and we go like, oh, Peter, what was he thinking? But Jesus told him to bring a sword to keep watch. And so we see instantly that we need to constantly stay in step with the spirit. Although he was called to keep watch in one moment, the next moment, Jesus says like, hold on, it's time now. Um, You're not keeping watch anymore. Put that sword away. Those that live by the sword will die by the sword. If you use the sword, you'll die by the sword. And and he reminds them, like, I don't need you to fight for me here. If if I wanted to, I could um, call 12 legions of angels, he says. Like, hey, Peter, you're kind of, like, you did okay with the sword. Like, you tried to hit him in the head. You caught his ear. I could call a better army than you. Um, if, If my goal was to fight back and push back, I could call 12 legions of angels, but he says, but then how would scripture be fulfilled? And so Jesus is arrested. And in that moment that he's arrested, his disciples, those he's poured over three years into, shown his authority to, his power over all things, they desert him and they flee. And so Jesus now is by himself with his enemies um, that have captured him, and they bring him before the Sanhedrin. Um, they bring him before Caiaphas, the high priest, and the chief priest, the teachers of the law, the elders. All of the Jewish religious leaders are there, and they've been plotting because Jesus has kind of upended their, their status, and um, it was a lucrative thing for them to be seen in the light that they were, and, and Jesus is making a way apart from their religious rule and uh, the laws that they had put in place, that through him there would be salvation and that he is the resurrection. And so they'd been plotting and conspiring to kill him. And they, they bring him before kind of the religious court now in this place and they bring false witnesses and, and try to 
drum up evidence, but they can't come up with any evidence, but they're, they're accusing Jesus of things and Jesus stands there silent. And eventually, um, and, and I wanna read this just in, in Mark 14, kind of the, the second part of verse 61 and all of verse 62, it says, again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's a great verse for us to constantly remember as people try to refute and say that Jesus didn't say that he is the savior, that he's God. He says, I'm going to go sit at the right hand of the mighty one. I am the son of God. I am the Messiah. I am the savior. And you're going to see me return on the clouds. Um, and at this, uh, there, there's an uproar. They say, blasphemy. And then it gets kind of hard to handle what happens to Jesus as they start to beat and brutalize Jesus. And, and, and we need to really understand this. Like Jesus is the only perfect, righteous, holy one to ever walk the face of the earth, fully innocent. And that he would put himself through what we're about to go through. Like he's already been betrayed by one of his disciples. The others kind of leave him as he's arrested. And now he will, the Bible say, he, they spit in his face. That they would strike him with fists. Jesus, the Savior. They would spit in his face. They would punch him. They, they would put a blindfold on him and, and slap him. And in a mocking way, say, prophesy. Prophesy, who hit you? And so they're beating him and he's blinded. And they, they say, it, if, if you're this great prophet, if you're the Messiah, which one of us hit you? And from there, as if that weren't enough, um, early in the morning on Friday, Good Friday, they take him from the religious courts, the Jewish religious courts, and bring him to kind of the Roman courts to bring him before Pilate. And Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you have said so. And then he's accused by those Jewish leaders that have brought him there. And, and he still gives no answer, which kind of is um, difficult for Pilate to understand that Jesus is being accused by all these people with some pretty um, difficult things and he's silent. And then he asks, Pilate asks, okay, this is the custom. We usually release one of the prisoners to you on this day. And so he understands that it's out of envy and out of their own issues that they want Jesus to be, um, that they're persecuting him and they want him prosecuted. And so he's giving them an out. And he says like, okay, you've brought it this far, but you want me to release a prisoner. Today's the day to do so. Do you want Jesus or do you want me to release Barabbas? And who, who, um, brought forth riots and was a murderer. And so essentially he asked, do you want me to release a murderer who's a known murderer or the Messiah um, to you? And they ask Jesus to be condemned, the Messiah, the Holy One, the only sinless one, and release the murderer. During this time, Pilate's wife has a dream and it is, is kind of tormented in, in, in distress because she has a dream about Jesus. And so she sends this word to Pilate to say, have nothing to do with what they're going to do to him. And, and so Pilate says, okay, you want me to release Barabbas? What do you want me to do with Jesus? And the crowd shouts out, crucify him. And Pilate says, on what grounds? Why, why would I do that? And instead of justifying their position or having a good argument, they just yell all the louder. The crowd yells, crucify him. And this is an interesting thing for us to think about because just because the majority in the moment or the loudest voices say something doesn't make it right. And it's good for us to remember that as believers, as the world can, can shout about a certain topic and have the loudest voice, just because it's the, the loudest consensus doesn't make it righteous. And so they yell out, crucify him. And Pilate washes his hands in water before them to say, hey, his blood is not on me. And they say, that's fine, which is just, they say, fine, his blood is on us. 
And so Pilate hands him over to be flogged, which, I mean, if your children are with you in the room, I'm grateful that they'll understand what's going on, but this is pretty brutal, and I won't get fully into it as I could. Um, but that Jesus would be laid open and, and his back fully revealed, and that these soldiers would take these whips that are these pieces of material with bones and rocks woven in, and sometimes metal balls and chunks so that when it hits the back, it not only bludgeons, but it also, <laughs> sorry for the mic clap, uh, bludgeons the body, but also grabs and tears flesh. And, and that Jesus, after being spit on and punched and slapped and falsely accused and then condemned, is now being torn to shreds by these soldiers and his, his skin is being opened up and exposed and that it would rip deeply into the flesh. And then he's from there handed over to the soldiers again and the soldiers would take him to this area and, and they would mock him. And, and to do so, they would strip him of his clothes put him in a, a purple robe or a scarlet robe, put a crown of thorns on his head and give him a staff to hold. He's already torn up. He's already, I mean, it, sometimes being flogged could kill a man. And, and so he's been brutalized. And now they mock him by putting this on him, a crown of thorns and stripping him, putting him in this kind of this false kingly outfit. And the Bible says that they, kind of kneel before him and mockingly say, Hail the King of the Jews, as they take a staff and strike him in the head again and again. That he is beaten by a mob with a staff, hit in the head with a stick as he has thorns on his head. When they're done with this mocking of Jesus, they put his clothes back on him and lead him out to be crucified. And the, the crossbars is too much for him to bear. And so they grab Simon of Cyrene and they, they force him to carry the cross of Jesus Christ to the place that he would be crucified. And fairly early still that morning at 9 a.m., they crucified Jesus, which was a brutal and humiliating way to execute someone. And it was actually held out for the worst of criminals. And that it was done so to make a mockery of them, to, to show them in front of everyone. It, it was that they nailed Jesus Christ through his hands and his feet, nerve centers of the body, by the way, onto the cross. And that you died there as if, as if I mean, what Jesus has already gone through is enough to kill a man. But they put him on the cross, and the, the way you died on the cross is asphyxia, asphyxiation. That, that you would basically slowly not be able to hold yourself up. And that you would start to not be able to clear air and, until your, your lungs would fill with fluid and, and you would drown, you would, you would suffocate on the cross. It would take anywhere from hours to days sometimes for people to die on the cross. And you were, this was done in full view of the people. This is done that everybody would see that you don't cross Rome, that you don't do these wrong things. And so Jesus at nine in the morning is placed up on the cross and the soldiers there cast lots for his clothes. There's a sign put above him on the cross that this is Jesus or Jesus of Nazareth the King of the Jews. We know that he's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Two rebels were crucified with him. I'm not gonna get into that whole piece right now, but as he hangs on the cross, he's insulted and mocked by the crowd. Jesus, who came to save those that are far from God, has been spit on, bludgeoned, beaten, torn open, mocked, and now as as he hangs on the cross, if they're, if they're casting lots for his clothes, that means his clothes have been removed. And so he's stripped on the cross, exposed to the world. 
and mocked and insulted by passersby. That they would say, you said you would save yourself. Or that you would save others. Save yourself. And that Jesus would take that. Take the insults. Take the mocks. Take the condemnation. Onto himself. And then from noon, at noon, while he's on the cross, the sky goes dark. And, and I can't imagine the scene as it gets, it's the darkest day in history in, in the way that there's never been a worse thing done, that wickedness and evil would kill the only righteous, sinless one on that day. And that in a literal way to symbolize that at noon it goes dark until 3 p.m. And at about 3 p.m., Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then in scripture it says, he cries out one last thing. And in John it says he cries out, it is finished. And then breathes his last and gives up his spirit. And I want you to understand that I'd love for you, I'm not gonna read it today, but I'd love for you to read Psalm 22. Because those two verses are the bookends of that chapter in Scripture. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is verse 1. At the end of Psalm 22, it says, He has done it. Which clearly shows it is finished. He's finished it. He's accomplished it. And that as you go through that, you can see that it portrays Christ on the cross. And that Jesus on the cross was reciting Scripture for himself and to those that were nearest by to hear what he was saying. And then he died. And when he died on the cross, it says that the earth was shaken. There's an earthquake. That the veil in the temple, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And what a beautiful picture that through the broken body of Jesus Christ, we put our faith in him. We now have access through Christ into the presence of God. And so Jesus goes through this and every time it chokes me up, every time it's difficult to work through the text because he did that for me. He didn't have to. I was not in a place deserving of him to go through that as if I was, was perfect and he was doing this to, to take it on for me. But me in my sin, my brokenness, uh, I put Christ on the cross and he did it for me. And so I want to just work through the rest of our time, which won't be long, it's just... Answering the question, why did Jesus go through all of this for us? Not even just the question of what did he accomplish for us. Because what he accomplished is the dealing with our sin. That we are separated with God because we have sinned against the holy and righteous God. And the only way for us to be reconciled is for that sin issue to be dealt with. That only through the perfect life of Jesus Christ and the death in our place for our sins on the cross. As we put faith in him, he takes our sins on himself at the cross and extends his righteousness to us. We need to know that. That is true. Sin had to be dealt with. But why did Jesus go through that? Why would he be brutalized? Why would he be beaten? Why would he allow himself to be spit on and mocked? and condemned and crucified. It's something even greater than that. The what he did is accomplish the, the dealing with our sins that we could be forgiven, the removal of our shame and guilt in him. But why? Simply, God loves us. Why did Jesus go through all of that? Because God loves us. God revealed his love to us through Jesus Christ through his life and his death in our place. Look at this. Many verses you've probably heard, and if you haven't, I, I just believe they're going to be a blessing for you as you think through Jesus taking your place, dealing with your sin and receiving the punishment due for you, on you for your sin, on me for my sin. It's because of the love of God. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That he loves us so much that he gives us life. 
and that life is found in Jesus. Jesus came because of God's love for us. Not because God had to do anything, but because he was moved to do so out of his love for us. Not because we deserved it, not because we had, had, had uh, earned it. In fact, the wage of sin is death. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God, out of his great love, sins Christ. John 15, 13, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. That Jesus shows what love is. Greater love has no one than this. Jesus says this before going to the cross to say that I'm going to show you what love is and that I love you and that you are my friends. I'm going to lay my life down for you. Romans 5, 6 through 8. You see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God demonstrates his love for us. If if we want to see God's love, we look to the cross, which seems difficult to wrestle through because of what Jesus had to go through, but it shows God's love that God would go to such measures to reveal his love to us and deal with our issue. Not because we deserved it, not because we were righteous and deserved someone to sacrifice for us or to take our place, but because we were broken sinners, rebels, enemies, apart from him, out of his great love for us. What motivated it? Why did Jesus go through it? Because of love for us. Because of love for us. As we were, it's not because we were lovely, (laughs) but because he is loving. 1 John 4, 9 through 11 says this, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's to pacify the wrath for our sins, the atoning sacrifice, to pay the price for our sins. That's why he had to die on the cross. But what moved him to do it? Love. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That what drove Christ to the cross so that we could be reconciled, so that we could be saved, so that we could be made right, so that we could be brought back into right relationship with God was the love of God for us seen in Christ. And that we would, when that's revealed to us, it would regenerate and it would transform and it would make us new and that we would live in Christ moving forward and that that same love we have received, we would give to others. Lastly, to reiterate it again, 1 John 3, 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. He gave himself for us and also gave us the ability and the example to lay our life down for others. As we think of Good Friday, it's hard to wrestle through why we would call it good when we look at what happened to our Savior, Jesus Christ. But as we remember why it happened and why he endured such things, we see the goodness, that it is good news, that God loves us so much that Jesus would pay the ultimate payment for us, for our sins, in our place, for everyone that puts their faith in Jesus Christ. There is forgiveness of sins, there is a removal of shame and guilt, there is a right standing with God that we are made whole and holy and purified in Christ Jesus. Today, we remember, uh, uh, A a, a brutal day, a a dark day, but also a glorious day for believers. And here's here's the, the thing we can be excited about. God loves us and we see it. 
God loves us and we know it. And we know that it's accomplished. We know that he fulfilled what he said he was going to fulfill because in a couple days on Sunday morning, come back for resurrection day uh, and, and join us as we talk about him showing his power over sin and death that he confirms and affirms and shows again that he is high above all, he has accomplished it all, it is truly done and we are right and we have hope and we have joy and we have a king that reigns and rules over all. I love you, remember this day, the love of God that he has for you and see it demonstrated in Jesus Christ and what he did for you and for me as we look back on this day. I love you. I pray for you. I can't wait to celebrate with you on Resurrection Day this Sunday. Until next time.